Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, Repayment of a Debt, written by Nerdy White Male. A man struggled up the rail. The pack on his back was both heavy and unwieldy. Hello up there, can you... He called out to the figure chained to the cliff. The titan looked up wearily. He didn't get much rest. But he got even less company. The valley he was in was only one entrance, and it was hidden by olive trees and scrubbed. Yes, human, I can hear you, although your accent is strange. Have you come to mock me? Did Zeus send you to learn what happens when others oppose his will? The man staggered up the nearby boulder and set his pack down with a sigh. No, um... I saw you up there last month while fighting the wildfires. I couldn't do anything but mark my map. Uh, Zeus didn't send me. Um, uh, I sent me. Uh, no man should have to suffer well, as you do. Uh, it's Prometheus, right? Prometheus looked down at the human. He was taller than the humans he remembered, but the face was the same, and his skin the same color as olives of the human that he helped create. Yes, I am Prometheus, Please, sit and talk. Tell me of what has happened outside this valley. The eagles shall be here in a few hours. I'm afraid our conversation will be at an end when they arrive. He nodded at the pile of bones that lay at the base of the cliff. Mostly animals, but there had been other humans who had discovered him and been around when the eagles arrived. The man grunted and pulled out a chisel and a hammer from his pack. Just let me know before they get you. My name's Antioch. And can you move your leg a bit? I just want to have a whack at those chains. As Antioch started looking over the binding, he started telling the bound titan of the fall of the Greek cities and the rise of Rome. Prometheus sighed. Humans had tried to free before. Hephaestus forged those. You have no hope, Antioch. The man held up the chisel. This is what you gave us. A hardened steel tool. We took fire and heated iron, and we added some carbon and sharpened it. Then we cooled it just right. This, he tapped the chain, is just iron. A lot of it, but nothing more than iron. And with that, the Antioch started hammering on the shackles that bound the titan. Antioch was working on Prometheus's left arm and was telling him about the fall of Rome when the titan next spoke. The eagles are coming. You must run, friend Antioch. There is a cave down to the left trail. Others have sheltered it. Please go quickly. If they see you, they will surely kill you. Antioch dropped his tools and scrambled back down the cliff to his back. Don't worry. Tool steel is not the only thing that we've created with your gift. He said as he struggled to get the heavy backpack on. Prometheus wept. As his friend did not run. Please go. The eagles are almost here. You are brave, but my arms are still bound. I cannot defend you. Antioch just smiled up at humanity's first friend as he flipped the visor of his helmet down and lit the pilot light on his flamethrower. Don't worry. You gave us fire, but I am more than happy to give a little back. The eagles screamed as they burned. Prometheus still wept, but for the first time in over 8,000 years, they were tears of joy. End of story. Story number two. Flesh Before Steel, written by Lager CZE. It is said that a human army is like a wave of steel, cold, unfeeling, and grinding ever onwards, and it sows death and reaps destruction, leaving nothing but ashes and ruin in its wake. If you fight the humans, chances are you won't even see the faces of their soldiers until the battle has long passed. What you'll quickly become accustomed to, however, will be the silhouettes of those countless tanks and mechs appearing over the horizon, kicking up dust as the landscape is crushed under their weight. There is no human screaming, no barked orders, merely the rumble of engines, on occasion drowned out by the explosions and whizzing shells. For some, the sight alone is too much to bear. An age has passed since the human troopers led charges, 
Today, their tasks are done by AI and robots, mechanical tools of a greater whole. A soldier in a human army is more likely to die as a result of some automaton than a decision to pull the trigger made by a human. The humans always reason differently when presented with this. They are just as likely to claim that it is more efficient to have a machine perform the tasks of the infantryman as they are to claim to protect the minds and hearts of humans from the horrors of the battlefield. But, above all else, they will refer you to the first and oldest rule of combat as stated by their officer manual, flesh before steel. There is no concept more sacred to a human war machine. Wherever you engage him, whatever your plans and your situation, they will always protect flesh with steel, and the more steel they can put between you and their flesh, the better. They will display endless creativity and use all resources available to protect even a single human from so much as a bruise. If you fire at a building containing real humans, real flesh and bone, you'll be met with a display of force none in the galaxy can match. Forget the warrior skills of the Mactark or the Zai's perfect intelligence. If you try so much as touch a hair on a human, you will become the target of a million automatons and crush you under their treads if it's that's what it takes to stop you from firing again. In one spectacular example, the human fleet sacrificed an entire AI-populated battleship and its support squadron in an attempt to stop an accidental kinetic bombardment of an area that they were evacuating a single human from. Said human was a civilian explorer who was, according to their own law, trespassing inside the exclusion zone and therefore a criminal. The human fleet considers this feat not only perfectly acceptable, but as awarded the AI that made this decision, an award for its performance on the field of battle. This attitude is widely considered to be a mild form of insanity by the galactic community, a feeble attempt at fighting wars in a sanitary fashion. You yourself may be convinced of this very same thing at this moment. But the humans are our allies, so I implore you to listen to me when I say that it might just be their biggest strength. It is widely known the human homeworld is unique. It is an environment lush with life, a place where the humans could evolve in relative ease. They are physically weak, never having faced the challenges our people did to simply survive. They live in a true garden, a place where even the harshest biomes can be tamed by fragile humans. It is a place so full of species that they've taken to preserving them all, even those no longer able to keep up with evolution. It is a human custom to protect the weakest link, if nothing else. To the most galactic armies, a single soldier costs less than the creation of a cruise missile. To a human, a hundred cruise missiles don't even begin to come close to the price of a sentient. A battleship, a complete with its magnetic accelerators and fusion cores, does not begin to come close. They'll fight tooth and nail to protect their right to weakness, and if they have to craft a fire that consumes the rest of the galaxy to do so, they might just do that too. That is why we let their automatons be the vanguard for every assault. With every battle, their pleas to let the machines fight instead of searching for the glory of combat becomes more and more urgent. For the longest time, I remained unfounded at their lack of will to fight, at how they cowered and sent machines, reasoning that they can replace them easier than they could replace one of their own. But now, as we sit here, celebrating another battle won, there's a hundred human engineers, a hundred beings of flesh and bone, working around the clock to rescue the survivors from the wrecks we just made of those flog warships. Human men and women, risking their lives to save beings who would gladly try and kill them if they get a chance, in an attempt to avenge their ships. They're out there with nothing but cutters, suits, and their fragile bodies, slaving away to save a few more sentient creatures. There are a few insignificant specks of stardust fighting to save their enemies. And I think finally I understand what they value enough to die for. End of story. This is a special thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Erak Hino, who has become the only Tier 6 patron. I just want to thank the T5 patrons and channel members. 
Bob the Dragon, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Australia the Dreamer, Trigon 95, Fjordic Yol, Meridian 117, Elysia, Jordan Buxborn, Angry Marine, Albard and Gasta, and Barky. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.